shall come to order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the University of St Andrews Union Debating Society, the oldest and some might say finest society of its kind anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tonight, just two days before St Andrews Day, the motion before the House is this House would support an independent Scotland. It's an issue that we're asking you as students in St Andrews to talk about, an issue to think about in Scotland and also for the, wi the wider world. Tonight we have four esteemed speakers from the Scottish Parliament and from London. On proposition, we have um, Nigel Don, who's an MSP for uh, Angus and a member of the SNP. We have Patrick Harvey, who's the co-convener of the Green Party and MSP for, Gla and MSP for Glasgow. And we have Willie Rennie, who's the head of the Liberal Democrats in Scotland. And we have Alistair Beaton, who's a political satirist, a playwright and writer. And after going for dinner with him, I know that we're in for a good treat tonight. So, don't, don't bet on it. <laughs> so, without further ado, I would like to invite the clerk of the house to read the minutes in the style of Braveheart. Order! Order, 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 order. Okay. <laughs> this is an interesting debate. Lucas' stuff is never that interesting. I motion that we take the minutes as read so we can get on to the interesting debate and get home. Ladies and gentlemen, Madam Speaker, we are here facing a fundamental challenge to the independence and sovereignty of those minutes by Parker, a man against whom a battle would prove deadly, a man who from the age of three has played with assault weapons. Um, I, I have to agree with Parker on this one, and not <laughs> off their counterpoint, but agree and say, you should probably do this, and I would, uh, like, offer unrestricted counter to it, and say, yes, fine, but on a counterpoint, already I feel the very blood in my veins turn to tart in colour at the sound of your speech. I say we hear the minutes in full. Yeah, 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 yeah. Voting is always will be by oral acclamation. Those of you who would like to take the minutes of the last meeting as read, say aye. Aye. Those of you who would like to dismiss the minutes of the last meeting, say nay. Nay. Rather close. I must ask my sergeant at arms. Um, I think we could do with some sovereign independence from Lucas's tyranny of terrible impression. <laughs> Let's take the minutes as read. They may take our lives, but they will never take a minute, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, I'd like to invite Mr. Dodd to open up the case for the proposition this House supports an independent Scotland. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I have to say it's a great pleasure to be back here. And of course, in saying that I come back, it reminds me that I did survive last time. I'm hoping that it will be the same result tonight. Last time I lost, but I was assured afterwards that the margin was the lowest that it had ever been. And therefore, I just think there's a possibility that this time we might win. Whether or not we win doesn't actually matter, because we are right. <laughs> but I would, apart from putting the proposition to you and trying to justify it, just like to just to set out a few of the ways in which we might actually be going to debate this over the next couple of years. So, and perhaps the ways in which you might, in years ahead, want to debate other things in your turn. <clears throat> So I wonder whether I could start by just asking you to reflect, and I know you're not all engineers, and I apologise because I was, but if you had three planks of wood which are ten foot long, sorry, that's three metres in modern currency, isn't it? Could you put together a bridge that would carry you across a 25, sorry, seven metre ditch? Now, I'm not going to take a vote on the subject. The answer... I hope you will understand is maybe. <coughs> and the reason it's maybe is because however you care to consider that proposition, you're going to have to bring in some assumptions. And all the things that we are going to say tonight will have behind them a set of assumptions. And those assumptions are often as important as the propositions we put forward. And so we have to be careful that we understand the presumptions the assumptions and the facts 
And again, if I can just work some of the assumptions through on this, if I could build that bridge, I'd maybe need a hammer and some nails. So the assumption would be that I had something as well as the planks. But even if I had all the materials, I would still depend on the facts because I might not have the skill to actually use the hammer to stick the nails in to build the bridge. So we have to be prepared to think around the argument and not just to take one line as being all there is to it. The other thing that I'd just like to point out, and I'm stating the blindingly obvious, but occasionally in my trade you have to, can I make the point that nothing is certain on this planet? I listen, as my colleagues in Parliament do, and perhaps as Alistair does as well, and maybe even you do it. First Minister's questions, it's always online, it's wonderfully entertaining, isn't it? You feel free to nod, I don't find it half as entertaining as it should be. And I find Joanne Lamont in particular, the leader of the Labour Party in Scotland, asking the First Minister to give cast-iron guarantees about this, that, or the next thing. Frankly, it doesn't matter. The moment she's asking for a cast iron guarantee, the moment she's asking for certainty, I know she's lost the plot. There isn't any certainty. I don't wish to be unkind. Perhaps I'll turn the finger back on me. I can't be certain I'll even be drawing breath this time tomorrow. And as to the consequences of the decisions we make in the political realm, there is never any certainty other than Point Mr. Rennie would like to ask me a question. Um, what I don't understand with Mr. Don's um, claims here is that he wants to add more uncertainty into an already uncertain world with his plans for independence. Why should we have any truck with him? Well, if you will... Allow me a, a few more minutes, and I'm hoping at some stage people will keep reminding me how many minutes I've got because I don't have a click in here. Um, you will see that there is probably less certainty in independence than there is at the moment. Now, I'd like to just make sure that we've got the point that there are many ways in which we can look at this, and I'm going to tell you beforehand, like a good lecturer, what they are and then cut them up. The first case, and it will be the obvious one, is the economic case. Can we pay our way... Would everything suddenly go belly up? And the answer, plainly, is no. The numbers are ones that we can dispute, but not a great deal. On balance, Scotland pays its way, and there's an awful lot of oil left out there in the sea. There's also a democratic case, which seems to me to be one of the most obvious ones, and that probably would appeal to yourselves. Would you rather be governed by a government that is elected, more or less proportionately, and sits down in Holyrood, <coughs> or would you be rather be governed by a bunch of MPs, only 10% of whom come from north of the border, a government, incidentally, which will never have a majority vote giving a majority in the House of, of Commons, and then, of course, on top of that, you've got the House of Lords, which is made up of goodness knows who. Now, I think there's a pretty obvious democratic case for saying we'd prefer what we've got in Scotland to anything that comes from Westminster. Thirdly, there's a social case. Quite frankly, we in Scotland do a lot of things differently. And again, you would only really have to look at the policies which are currently coming north from London and our response up here as a general society, never mind as politicians, to what's going on to recognise that we would do things differently. Fourthly, <coughs> pardon me, there's an international case. And it has to do with Scotland's role and place in the world, and not just within the United Kingdom. And I would argue, and I'm sure others would argue, and I imagine Patrick will argue in time, that Scotland would have a significant voice on its own, which would probably, in some areas, be far more effective than as being a part of the United Kingdom, whose voice is often not well listened to, particularly, I might say, within Europe. There is also a cultural case. Scotland is not England, and it is not Wales. Now, how you define us is not easy to do, but then if I were to speak, and I suspect there are a good number of North Americans within earshot, about the culture of America, could you define it for me? I very much doubt it, because it's an amalgam of all sorts of things, all sorts of national expressions which have learned to work together. Scotland is to some extent that, only smaller. Point of information. Indeed. Um, I mean, is he not making the case for a United Kingdom? With all our different cultures, with all our different nationalities, we can work like the United 
states that is greater than the sum of its parts. You could. You could, but you don't need to. And it doesn't necessarily work like that. One of the advantages of being a small unit, and it doesn't matter whether you're a small business or a small family or a small country, or arguably even a small political party, the advantage of being small is something that I might describe as focus. It's very much easier to work out what you're doing. It's very much easier to communicate effectively. And a small group of folk can often achieve what a large group could never have agreed to achieve. There's also an environmental case for Scotland being independent. And I'm going to come back to the areas which we would call nuclear, whether it's nuclear power, whether it's nuclear weapons, or the antithesis of that, which might be peace and harmony, and at the very least would be renewable energy. Some of that has actually to do with that whole point about focus. If Scotland didn't have to be the home of nuclear weapons, then maybe we'd get on with doing a few other things on the Clyde. I'm very happy that we're not talking about nuclear power stations, because otherwise we'd be spending all our time <laughs> debating them, whereas actually we can get on with being the powerhouse of renewable energy. So there are the whole range... Just half a moment, if I answer. There are those whole range of different ways of looking at the argument. And I would encourage you over the next couple of years, never mind the next hour and a bit, to reflect on whether any of those point in a different direction, which of these is important. And in my view, they all add up to pointing in the direction of independence being a good idea. I don't think any of them suggest that independence is actually a bad idea. And I would take you back to my primary thought at the very beginning that there are absolutely no certainties. So if somebody wants to tell me, well, how can I be sure that an independent Scotland will do this, that or the other? Just reflect <coughs> on the alternative question, which is how can I be sure that staying the way we are would help the problem? Am I allowed to? Just, yeah. 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 Yeah, um, on a point of information, if, would, uh, would Donald Trump's golf course be an example of Scotland's concern for the environment? <laughs> <laughs> Go on, answer that. Go on. <laughs> um, I'm assured. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Go on. Because I've not been there. That Donald Trump's golf course is a fine golf course. <laughs> I am absolutely sure that if whoever it was who started the old course here was to come along to the pristine sand dunes that would have preceded it, sought planning permission to build the old course the answer would have been no. So actually, much of what we have by way of golf courses and the infrastructure around us is an accident of history. It's at the very least a consequence of history. And one of the extraordinarily interesting things of being in politics at whatever level is the number of times people tell you you cannot do it but actually, we did it before. Was it the monks that um, I'll golf? give you an absolute classic, because I'm monks. straight off the subject for the just half a moment. I represent a place called Stonehaven, which is somewhere up there. I'm kind of assuming north that way. I'm just hoping I've got my bearings right. Um, and there's a wonderful road that goes down, heading, heading north, coming down to, to, to Donotta. It's from Donotta uh, Castle down into Stonehaven. And down the braes there, 